thanks everyone for joining. Um, just quick introductions at the top here. So I'm Steve Simone. I'm CEO and co-founder of a company called Bebot. We're a New York City restaurant technology company um, specializing in software that really helps operators, restaurateurs run a more efficient business. Um, so we specialize in a lot of different ordering software workflows for operators. And I'm joined here by my friend and counterpart, Russ Rosenband. Russ, why don't you give a little background of yourself? Sure. So my name's Russ. I come from the commercial real estate world. Um, I met Steve because I was looking to put a piece of smart ordering technology in a food hall I was building down in the Lower East Side of Manhattan a few years ago. Um, really love what Steve and the team are building. And I'm, I'm excited to see where the future of restaurant tech goes because it's kind of the wild, wild west right now. So nice. that's why I'm here. And lastly, um, you know, all good webinar productions have a sound guy. <laughs> so we got, we're joined by Zach. Zach, why don't you intro yourself? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Zach Drehoff. I am a sales engineer uh, here at Bebot with a uh, background in restaurant operations as well as uh, POS uh, sales engineering. So excited to be here. All right. So here's what we're going to do today. It's a little bit of a, a survey of you know what's going on right now in buildings in commercial real estate. Um, then we'll jump into a demo that Zach will show about um, how to do ordering in a virtual food hall environment from the consumer angle, just a quick five minute you know, demo. And then lastly, we'll uh, take any questions from the audience. So hopefully this can be thought provoking and a little fun today. All right, so when we talk about commercial real estate, you know, one of our uh, partners we work with is a company called Related, and this is their, a picture of their property in New York City. Um, so this is, they have a couple of big buildings here. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of offices and a lot of hungry mouths to feed. And so Related is a company interested in trying to find unique ways to service those office tenants. Um, and they're really kind of a, a leader in trying to figure this out, but there's many other um, shapes and sizes of buildings that not, not as big as this that are also trying to figure out this problem. So I don't know, Russ, if you want to talk about some other br other brands besides related that you've worked with that are also thinking about this problem. Oh, you're muted, I think too. Got it. A bunch of the large institutional landlords uh, in Manhattan is what I can speak to or trying to figure out how do we create a safer and more amenitized experience for our office workers and our residents upstairs? Because ultimately they're the ones that pay the rent, right? So if every day, office tenants have to spend 15 minutes going up and down escalators, getting temperature checked, waiting for their seamless or delivery courier at the front. It's a huge hindrance on their ability to do what they do, which is, you know, get work done. So all these landlords are trying to figure out how do I reduce occupant flow throughout my buildings because of COVID? How do I create a more amenitized building so my tenants will effectively enjoy working there more and long-term pay me more rent? And thirdly, which is why I'm so excited about what we're working on, Steve, is by working with a company like Bebot, these landlords can actually direct business directly towards their food and beverage tenants and not make them as reliable on third-party delivery apps. Because if you're a restaurant on the ground floor and someone's ordering you know, 15 floors up, why should that restaurant pay 30% to DoorDash or Grubhub or Seamless if literally the person could go down an escalator and get it themselves? So. I think working with groups like Related and Silverstein and Jamestown and Moyne and Tishman Spire, who are some of the bigger ones trying to figure this out, to help the restaurants become more profitable and the tenants have a better yeah. experience is kind of how to create this ecosystem that everyone's trying to figure out. Yeah, and I originally was, when we were talking um, even like two years ago with these companies, one of the, I mean, just one of the simplest problems they were trying to solve was like a better experience for the office workers of you know, if you're in this big building where my mouse is here, like if you're on the, you know, hundredth floor and you order Uber Eats, like, or Seamless, you have to go all the way down and try to find that guy. And like, it's a shopping mall below. So it's chaos. And just like even ordering delivery is a difficult challenge here. So they're just trying to, you know, make that a little easier for their, their office tenants, which is basically their guests. <laughs> they're in the mm -hmm. hospitality industry too now. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. So here's, Here's really what I wanted to 
and and as a little bit of a history lesson, um, you know, we're gonna go through what I call the first generation of this, which I think was really pioneered by a company called Ritual. I don't know if you agree, Russ, but if you think back, I mean, this was probably mid 2010s when they really started growing. Mm-hmm. And they kind of pioneered, I mean, in New York City, at least, they really pioneered like, like they, I think they started in the Midwest and like Toronto, Canada, but when they came to New York City, you started to see them everywhere. I don't know if, I don't know if you remember when that started popping up everywhere, but they mm-hmm. were in like the bottom of every building, basically. Mm-hmm. And they were, they were this pickup model. Um, and so we'll get into that. And then we'll talk about the second gen and what, what we see as the third gen uh, coming out now. So I'll start, why don't I start with the uh, first gen and then you can talk about the outposts and smart locker, what we see as the second gen. So, you know, in the first generation, like this was um, just a very basic model, which I still think is um, very efficient, um, which is basically if you're built, if you're a commercial real estate operator and you have a bunch of restaurants and you're in like the bottom like floor area and you have a lot of office tenants above, you know, putting in something like a ritual was the model a few years ago where you know, you could advertise this app to your tenants and they could download it. And it would be something that they would use to order and pick up food from the restaurants below. Um, this worked really well. And I think that in the 2016, 2017 timeframe, this was the main, the main model for office workers um, ordering pickup during lunch. And a lot of um, companies followed on Ritual trying to trying to get in on this. And I think one of the, the disadvantages of it was, you know, like it worked really well, um, but, you know, ritual companies like that had to spend a lot of money acquiring the consumer to download their app. Um, and there wasn't really a collaboration between the property managers and, and these companies. It was mostly the companies going direct to consumer and then uh, going direct to the restaurants and, you know, kind of circumventing the, the commercial real estate operators and, and the experience that they were trying to give to their tenants. But it did fill a need. And I think this was really the, the start of people thinking about buildings as hospitality operations, um, because the tech companies, the tech companies saw a, a hole and tried to fill it. Any, anything you want to add there, Russ, or is that, is that a pretty good overview of that? No, I think it's a good overview. It was kind of the low-hanging fruit, right? Everyone's coming down to pick up food every day. Let's make it easier for them to do that function. And so it was definitely a pioneering effort um, and kind of the first inning, I would call it. Yeah. So so the second inning, why don't you, I know you're passionate about these lockers. So why don't you talk about then the evolution, I think, really. Yeah, I mean, I think we all know Sweetgreen pioneered the kind of outpost model. They realized very quickly that by building an app that was like within three clicks, you could reorder every single day. They had customers that were coming back to them three, four, five times a week for salads. Mm -hmm. And so they started thinking, instead of taking a direct to consumer approach, why don't we take a business to business approach and go to these businesses and say, 20 of your employees are coming downstairs every single day to get salads. Why don't you just let us put a shelf in your office and deliver directly to you every day in bulk? Um, Funny enough, if you actually go see some of these outposts, a lot of times someone just drops 20 salads in the kitchen. There's actually no physical outpost, but it was the idea of this business to business delivery model that I think totally changed the game. And it's why you've seen, you know, Minnow and a lot of these smart lockers now coming out. I'm not as interested in kind of the technology driven smart lockers. That that to me just seems excessive because I've picked up Mm -hmm. food off of an Ikea shelf a thousand times and it's just as good. (laughs) <laughs> um, but I think the innovation is working with property managers and office managers to say, hey, there's a better way for your employees to get their food. Let's bundle all the orders together and bring it to them at a specific time. Um, and that was really the innovation and why I think going forward, food delivery companies and restaurants should be working more with building managers to create a hospitable experience for the end user. Yeah. Have you seen... Um... Like, so I, I mean, the shelving thing, you know, depending on the commercial real estate entity, you know, they have, they have mixed feelings about it. Like the shelves, like, have you seen friction getting these shelves into, you know, large buildings? You know, I think right now there's nobody 
really pioneering this closed loop delivery ecosystem. You know, our buddy Scott over at figure eight is really like is leading the charge in my mind, but I don't think landlords have fully gotten behind this concept yet. And so, you know, until there's really a platform and a, a protocol to point to and say, this is a perfect case study, it's going to be hard to get landlords on board. But the first landlord or group of landlords that says, you know what, this is a smart idea and I'm actually going to spend some money and put some design efforts behind it, I think is going to be pleased. But I haven't seen anybody do it the way that I would do it just yet. Yeah. Well, I think that the, um, yeah, on the smart locker piece, I think the they're a little capital intensive to, I mean, if you look at the, even the picture here, like the Amazon lockers too, that uh -huh. these are like kind of like those, just some of these, there's just too many people. I don't, I don't think they're actually, it's like they don't serve enough people for like the lunch, like at least in New York city, like these I are mean, little... when I look at the lockers, man, like the, what I see is cheap marketing opportunities. So like, I don't need a very expensive locker that keeps food warm. What I need is a good looking sleek shelf that reminds my tenants every single day how easy it is to order from the restaurants in the building and the surrounding neighborhood. That's that's the special sauce here is how do we make people excited to order and send business directly to our own tenants so that they're not using Uber Eats and Grubhub and Seamless plugging in a $10,000 locker so it keeps the food warm. To me, like you said, it's super capital intensive. And really the important part is just helping people know that this ordering platform exists, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think with Sweetgreen, they've done a good job um, in their major markets, at least, you know, getting app installs so that people know they exist. And I don't know if you, I've been to a lot of my um, like partner tech companies, I've been in their offices or before the pandemic was in, where was in their offices, like when I'd visit and they didn't have a sweet green outpost, but like, as you mentioned, they just had like a sign in the kitchen yep. that said, Hey, you can order sweet green, which is basically just marketing. Like obviously anyone could order anything. Like we were talking about this earlier, Steve, like these companies are spending so much money on, on marketing dollars, right. Through social, through Facebook, through your phone to like acquire new customers. Yeah. If someone's going in and out of the same building twice a day, 365 days a year and they can see effectively a billboard or an advertisement like that to, and they they literally experience eating in their bedroom or in their office every single day that is a much more higher touch point than doordash paying 85 cents to get a you know an ad on the on the instagram scroll so i just think it's a super high touch point that landlords should be uh thinking more about yeah i mean um and not to get too far ahead of ourselves but going to the third gen, but also kind of still talking about the second gen. So the third gen is, um, uh, we got a spelling mistake here. That's a courier. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyways, third gen is like these micro couriers and, um, you know, doing app and web-based ordering in a general sense. So taking that sweet green concept, but generalizing it to, um, the food and beverage near the building that isn't just sweet green. Um, but here's the challenge. And then we were just talking about this before the webinar started, um, which is like, if you're gonna do these virtual restaurants or restaurants and that the people don't maybe not know about as much as sweet green because they're not marketing as much, how do you get those in front of your tenants? How do they know about it? And I think this is a challenge that all the commercial real estate operators are thinking about this marketing challenge. So what are your, what are your thoughts on this third gen coming to fruition because of that, that challenge? My thoughts are that landlords have to have to see their responsibility in this whole ecosystem. Like everyone's complaining that DoorDash is too expensive. The restaurants aren't making any money, blah, blah, blah. But building owners have not taken a real responsibility for their role that they could potentially play in making this whole system work. And so I think it's something as simple as a QR code next to the elevator before you go up to your apartment, right? Or a simple email reminder from your landlord reminding you that, you know, there's taco Tuesdays and there's 25% off margaritas, like just little things that landlords can do to partner with existing restaurants to basically funnel revenue directly into the restaurant's bottom line. Um, because like we've been talking about right now, the marketplaces are so successful because everyone just uses them as, you know, de facto, like I got to eat something, I go to DoorDash and find something new. 
if landlords took a more meaningful role and said, look, these are the 15 restaurants around you that we can bring directly to your door. And oh, by the way, delivery is free. All of a sudden, the restaurants are doing better. The landlord's providing an amenity to their, to their tenant. And the tenants are happy because they're saving money. So I think the big hurdle here is just getting landlords to understand that this is a massive opportunity for them to extract excess value from their existing real estate and provide a better level of service to their tenant. Yeah, I think it's understand. I mean, understanding the massive opportunity though, it seems like it could be easy. You know, you know the commercial real estate operators have like these owners have a ton to do. You know, like they're very busy just, you know, forgetting food and beverage for a moment. All the other things they have to do just to get the building up and running and yep. working function functioning. Like, is there serious is there a serious dollar opportunity for them here? Is it just a matter of a better like so they provide a better guest experience? I guess that's great. But like, is it actually moving the needle on their balance sheet? Like, do you think it will? Like, I, I don't I don't know. You're the expert. Moving the needle on the balance sheet, I'd say probably not. Right. I mean, these guys have hundreds of millions of dollars in NOI. And I don't think that, you know, working with a online ordering provider will necessarily move the needle there. Um, I do think it can, it can be a profit center, right? If they are, instead of letting orders go through Uber Eats and DoorDash, if they're instead capturing a dollar or two per order because they sent the revenue through, it can be a small profit center. Um, but I think more important than any of this is like, every landlord that owns office space or densely populated residential is trying to figure out how do I keep my buildings occupied and how do I keep my tenants paying rent given where we are with COVID and like what the future looks like of office space. So anything a landlord can do to retain tenants, I think is gonna be a massive value add. So if you assume that like office rents are gonna drop by 30% and occupancy is gonna drop by 20%, and that with a small 20, 30, 40, $50,000 investment, it can help get your occupancy and your rent back to a normal level. In that case, it could be a meaningful piece in like moving the needle on the balance sheet. Yeah. And also perhaps, and um, we still need more data on this, but we're, we're trying to gather it at Bebot too, is the, the restaurants themselves, you know, driving a little bit of incremental sales to those restaurants that are on the properties um, you know, at least helps them and keeps them paying rent and happy, which is important for, uh, the op, the owners of the building to not have to like worry about replacing them because, you know, keeping them in, keeping them in good standing is just a great, great for everyone. I'm all for breaking down barriers between landlord and tenant. And I think a landlord to be able to go to a prospective tenant and say, Hey, Mr. Restaurant operator, not only am I going to work with you and lease you this space, but also I'm going to take my 5,000 employees or residents upstairs and I'm going to actively drive business towards you. And it's not going to be going through Uber Eats, who's taking 30%. It's going to be going directly through your direct to consumer channel. Like you're, you're playing an active role in the success and the profitability of your restaurant tenant. It might be a thankless job, Steve, like maybe it doesn't move the needle big time on the landlord's balance sheet, but it's all a part of providing service to your tenants. And that's really what these landlords are in the business of doing is keeping their buildings leased and their tenants happy. So I no, think it's I, a small price to pay if you own a you know $150 million asset, like put a shelf in the ground floor and let's help people get their food quicker and cheaper. No, I, I totally agree. And I think that, and we'll get into this on the next slide, um, talking about the, the new prop tech companies that are trying to help in this world too. But it is a small price to pay, but I think as we've seen, even talking to these owners is that where does this new budget come from? Like, yes, they have a $150 million asset, but they've never really purchased this type of product before. You know, we're still trying to, I think we're still also trying to learn who's the buyer over yeah. there. And in the, in the, in, in, I don't know, what are your thoughts on who will become the buyer? Will they create a new role for this? Will there, will be, the, will there be a new like tenant experience manager? I think it's someone in tenant experience. I do. I mean, you already see a lot of landlords that are staffing up for, for things of that nature. Look back when, back before buildings were amenitized, um, a lot of buildings didn't have concierges and companies like live didn't exist. Um, you have all these startup companies that are basically trying to fill that void and be that kind of amenity provider. 
So perhaps it's the amenity provider that's suggesting that landlords do this, but ultimately I think the landlord has to be the buyer. Yeah. I mean, that, that kind of segues into the next slide here about one of the things I've, I mean, when we started BBOT in San Francisco, I never, I never thought we'd move to New York and then learn about all of this stuff, but this is just the way the, this is where the momentum has, has taken us. And one of the most interesting set of companies that I've come across as CEO of BBOT is these, uh, the category of prop tech in the tenant experience apps. Um, we've got companies like HQO, Lane, Hilo, there's seven or eight more major ones. And these companies are pioneering, uh, basically like wrapping all of the experiences and things that tenants need to do in a building in a building environment, like from, from reserving rooms to renting uh, freight elevators to even now ordering food, like from back of the house logistics stuff to food and food ordering and trying to wrap that into one app for the tenants. Um, so really they're kind of like an aggregator of sorts where Bbot would be the food ordering app inside of Lane or inside of HQL. Does that make sense? Have you seen these pop up for us? Yeah, and I think that's a great channel partner for for a company like Bebot to have. You know, I could flip the question to you. You just asked me, like, where does the budget come from from HQO? And I mean, the answer, oh yeah, I mean, the answer is the buildings feel like tenants are going to like it enough that they're going to want to be there more and pay more rent and blah blah blah. The same exact pitch that we would be that we're basically giving landlords, which is they want to eat more, cheaper, it's faster, it's easier, it's smoother, all of that. It's found a budget if you think there's value to the end user. Yeah, I I agree. And there are still, uh, these companies are very new. They're still finding their their buyers, but they're, they have their, the buyers are out there. We've, we've spoken to them. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And the, the interesting thing is they are trying to, you know, sit in the cross section of all of these different these different things that a tenant wants to do and ordering food ordering is just, just one of them. But as we, you know, you and I have discussed, we think it's one of the larger parts of it all. Um, Cause it's something that people do every single day. You might not reserve a freight elevator every single day or, you know, reserve a new conference room, but you do, you will do ordering. You have to eat every day. Um, so we think that's a major, major part of what these companies are trying to, to do. And I, I do think that, they are going to be good at getting their app installed on consumers' phones because, they, because they're offering a bunch of other value besides ordering though. So this could be a good way for companies like Bebot or other companies that are trying to do similar things to what we're doing to get in front of the, the, oper the tenants basically um, and, and lower that acquisition cost for the owners. So I'm pretty excited about these guys. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So let's talk about um, switching gears a little more, more technical. Uh, so let's talk about the this virtual food hall concept or really a food hall concept, it's not even virtual, of these are real businesses in the, the bottom of these buildings that are kind of grouped together. And we're going to show a software demo of this in a, in a second, but they're grouped together. Take the Hudson Yards use case. You got nine or so businesses at the in Hudson Yards, and you've got all these offices and apartment buildings above. So you got the you know you've got your Abington House, which is an apartment building. You've got your 30 Hudson Yards office tower. You've got your outdoor spaces. So these are all like on the campus, we'll call it. And so, you know, what we're doing at Bebot is we're making software that you know essentially takes the menus from all of those different places on the campus, aggregates them. And for the guests and lets you deliver from, you know, multiple different spots to the spot on the campus that you are currently at. So this is, this is the new thing. This is generation three on our, on our roadmap. We were presenting to all of you that's popping up right now and that everyone's trying to figure out um, how to do this best. I guess one thing I'd add to that, Steve, in the last like three weeks, you've had a handful of companies that have launched office delivery and why is all this money being poured into um, like virtual kitchens and DoorDash and food delivery? It's because food delivery is a really difficult business. At the end of the day, people are price conscious and they don't feel good spending $20 to get a little acai bowl. 
But at the same time, we have to pay somebody to bring the acai bowl from the kitchen to that person's apartment. So it's a it's fundamentally a broken model. And so by aggregating all of the restaurants in a mixed use development kind of under this landlord umbrella, we can get economies of scale to get all of your residents or your office tenants, anything delivered at any time, anywhere in actually an affordable and profitable way. Whereas if all of these disparate users are ordering from all these different restaurants whenever they want, and we have to pay one runner to run one taco to one floor, you're never going to get economies of scale. And that taco will always cost you 20 bucks. So this is a really hard, like, it's a hard problem to crack. And I don't think anybody like we've been talking about has done as perfected, although companies like Related are really working to figure it out. This is a massive opportunity for landlords to win, consumers to win, and ultimately restaurants to win, which is, you know, what Bebot's mission is. Yeah. I mean, it is a tough, it is tough. Uh, for those listening, you know, and I see some questions rolling in. So that's going to be great. We'll get to the questions at the end, but it's a hard problem. It's an exciting problem that we're all working on. Um, on the, co- on the topic real quick of making it more efficient, because that delivery does cost money. There are things that everyone is trying, um, you know, whether that is adding catering to the mix, you know, so it's larger orders. Um, you And actually, there are some companies that did this really well pre-pandemic. I don't know how they're doing now. I haven't followed up, but like, have you seen Stadium? Yep. I mean, Stadium was doing a really interesting catering model that drove a lot of demand to to operate or restaurants. Um, and I, I know that a lot of office managers really liked that. that yep. system. So they were they were doing it, I think, pretty efficiently. But the the idea of getting like on demand one or two items, like one or two meals, that's still that delivery challenge. That that cost is really real of the delivery. And I guess one of the ways people are trying to make that more efficient, maybe Rush, you can talk to this because you know Scott and those guys, and they're experts at this, but the concept of like virtualizing the food hall, can you talk a little bit about actually virtualizing it and if that's going to help make it more efficient? What do you mean by virtualizing it? Like basically, you know, making it so that the operational cost of the restaurant is lower itself so that they can actually offer that lower price potentially. Is that is that one way or is there just no way to make the delivery cheaper? It's really difficult to make the delivery cheaper unless, and this is one thing I'm working on with Scott and a couple of projects, unless uh, you batch deliveries at certain times, right? The sweet green model of delivering 40 salads at 1130 is one way to make delivery more affordable. As long as you have one person running one meal to one person, it's going to be really difficult to get economies of scale. And I think landlords will have to think about how important it is to have that functionality. If they need that kind of on-demand functionality, the landlord might have to foot the bill for a full-time runner. But if a landlord is game to say, have one or two drops a day or two drops at breakfast, two at lunch, two at dinner, they can then staff appropriately in a way that won't be a huge, a huge cash expense. Um, this, this is a question. So like we have, um, so with our customers, our, our live customers right now, they, they wanted to pursue the on-demand model. It's expensive. Like you can order any time on BVOD at these buildings and, and that is expensive. We've seen that be expensive. We've thought about trying to batch it because we, you know, we offer batching and like the, the time slots in our software. The issue is they felt like the guests, the, the tenants wanted that on-demand experience of, of a seamless or a DoorDash, you know? Well, look, that's why DoorDash will win, right? Because they've raised hundreds of millions of dollars and they can offer free delivery. You know, it's just that it's a luxury that many startups can't afford, unfortunately. Um, Cause the dollars have to come from somewhere. Runners aren't going to work for free. So you have to either batch it and provide that as like the top level of service you're willing to provide, or someone's got to foot the bill for the runner. The other thing I wanted to point out, Steve, is that what I love about a lot of these mixed use communities and campuses is that landlords have really invested time and energy into green spaces and rooftops and gardens and, you know, um, what's really cool about the model that we're talking about here is that if you want to enjoy a bucket of beers and some nachos with your friends, you don't, you don't always have to go to the restaurant anymore. With this model, you can order $150 worth of food 
to the 27th floor rooftop where you're playing cornhole and barbecuing, right? And all of a sudden, you create that hospitality experience through a delivery module within a mixed use campus. And it means that the restaurants can now reserve some of those seats for other walk-ins and basically provide the on-premise experience on the campus, even if it's not taking up capacity within their four walls. And I think that's really important to understand because you're talking about restaurants basically increasing their capacity and going from you know 40 seats in their restaurant to all of a sudden 3,000 seats within a four block radius. And you and I always like kind of uh, fantasized a couple of years ago, like, can you get things delivered to a public park where you're sitting at the third tree and all of a sudden you get your picnic delivered? That restaurant didn't have that as a de delivery zone until something like Bebot or another one of these delivery yeah. location-based functions existed. So how do we use technology to increase capacity for restaurants. That's like, no, that's I, what, I that's think what we're that, doing. that is, I, I'm excited about that. I know you were trying to implement that at your project in Essex crossing, but, and I think that that's like the, the coolest thing that I, we still haven't totally all perfected yet, but the mm -hmm. technology is there now. And it's just a matter of, you know, you have that, that terrace on the 30th floor that you want to activate, you know, the technology is there for owners to do that now. I don't and know we've they... seen it with outdoor seating, like restaurant owners added 30 seats outside. And now that's probably going to be a permanent fixture of their restaurant. And they're like, oh, great. We added capacity. And yet when you implement technology and take things off premise, it feels like things, it feels like you don't have that excess capacity, but we should be looking at it as added seats and added customers that we can reach without going through this whole third party delivery ecosystem. That's just taking everybody's money. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So let's, let's do a quick for those who wanted to see a software demo. We'll, we'll show you what we're going to show you, then we'll show it. And then we'll jump back into a session, just discussing some recent current events of this crazy virtual brand stuff that we want to just touch on <laughs> here. It's, it's top of mind for everyone. Um, okay. So what we're going to show you is like a, a consumer side workflow web-based um, that any owner can implement very quickly. Uh, so essentially we've got this idea of showing a, a branded web page um, for your for your building, for your tenants. And tenants can select between um, getting delivery to their office, uh, as you can see here, different offices, or doing pickup um, or selecting a catering operation. So, different choices depending on what you're trying to as an owner provide your tenants um and so you don't you can mix and match these um to your liking and we're going to just show you a little bit of the consumer side there but the real magic happens behind the scenes where be, depending on which uh, delivery location you order from then there's software running behind the scenes to manage the logistics of getting that to that spot um so why don't we turn this over to Zach to show um, the virtual quick demo of just an ordering checkout experience, Zach. Sure thing. Here we go. Um, how do I? So this is something. So for all the owners and operators out there, this is a, a demo account Zach's put together as a as an example. Yeah, and, and certainly anyone can visit mybuilding.menu if they want to see this and, and test drive it for themselves, but. Yeah, basically everything, Steve, that you just mentioned. Um, so a branded ordering site for the mixed use campus um, that is uh, compatible for desktop or mobile. And within this, we've got a couple of different options. And, and on the slide deck, I think we talked about pickup and catering. We don't have that in this demo. We instead have uh, order local delivery. And, and Russ, this is something that you mentioned as a, a, another potential opportunity for these uh, landlords to provide amenities, not just to folks on the campus, but to maybe folks that live in the surrounding areas, driving business to the restaurant tenants. Um, but within this demo, I'm gonna select a pickup location. And this will bring me to, um, an order flow that allows me to select from any and all tenants uh, that are within the building. And I'll add a couple different things here. Let's add a pizza. Let 
Do we want to get oh, yeah, so a burrito at top, bowl? At the top there, those are the different restaurant brands in the demo, right? Yep, certainly. So um, not only do we have an opportunity for uh, the landlord to, to brand their experience uh, throughout, um, we also have the ability for the individual vendors to provide their own branding uh, to separate and differentiate themselves. Nice. So I'll order some sushi too. And from the guest side of, of things, I've got one singular cart. I'm paying one time to access uh, and obtain all of these different items from different vendors. Um, I guess on the back end, in, in terms of the restaurants, each restaurant will receive their own individual order and only that. Um, I will nice point out that, you know, what we talked about, we, we do have the ability to configure these order ahead um, delivery times for singular drops. We could configure it as ASAP orders if we wanted to, whether that's you know through this outpost delivery model, whether it's a, a guest pickup, whether it's a delivery, these are all you know customizable and configurable options depending on how we want to set things up. Um, I'll just put in a promo code here so that we can place this order for free. Um, through this, we have the ability to configure whatever guest information we want to obtain. Right now, I've got it just name and number, but if it was a resident building, we could you know, configure the room number. Lots of different options here. Free? What? The whole purpose is to drive money to these restaurants, dude. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Sound guy. Right. <laughs> So once the order's placed, I, you know, the guest gets an update of, of where their order is at. Once it's been accepted, once it's ready for a, uh, a runner to pick up and. Yeah. Let me, let me chat on this one for a second. Scroll down just a bit. Sure. So this, these are customized statuses here now. So this is where the magic happens. Like, and this goes back to the sweet green, you know, shelving model, which I think that was a genius idea that they, they created a couple of years ago, which is, okay, now we've placed an order from multiple vendors. Now there's this logistics issue of how do we gather up all of those orders and how do we deliver it to the office building number two, which Zach picked as his location code, or maybe there's a shelf that we deliver it to. These are the things owners are thinking about now, this logistics and who's actually doing the running. Bebots, um, we're a software provider that you know helps facilitate these different workflows, but you know, I, there's a lot of different potential workflows. So love to hear from, you know, if you have a specific idea in mind, you know, we'd love to hear it. And we're hearing new great ideas from owners every single day, but essentially these statuses here are customizable and they communicate to the guest where their order is um, in the current flow until it's on its way to them. Certainly. And, and not only, you know, through the checkout page here, but we also have the ability to send text messages out to the guests at different port, uh, parts of the, the order process. So um, yeah, lots of different ways that we can communicate where the food is at uh, to the guest. All right. And hey, Zach, I'm going can you go back to, uh, to the homepage. Yeah. Go back to the homepage. Yeah, sure. It's something I want to point out. I don't know who, is gonna be watching this webinar if it's mostly restaurant operators or landlords, but I wanted to point something out if you're a restaurant operator. The same way that you configure the restaurant page, right, to be totally your brand is the same way that you can configure this for a building. So if you're a restaurant operator with a couple brands or you're in downtown Denver, let's say, and you're trying to figure out an innovative way to expand your footprint, one thing you could do is try to get in touch with some of these large building owners down the street from you and say, hey, we can make, like I'm, I already have this customizable website, right? That says Dan's Wings, right? Very simply, we can create a new URL that says, you know, mybuilding.menu. It'll still be everything that's on Dan's Wings, but it'll enable the building owner to provide a white labeled solution for his residents to be able to order through. So if you are a restaurant owner, and you know a big landlord or you want to be able to sell into some of these larger commercial projects, you guys know from the BBOT side of things, all we have to do is put up a new landing page and a new URL, and we can effectively white label an ordering solution for the landlord. 
So just keep that in mind. If you are a restaurant owner, um, you can also make use of this landlord platform. You have to just do a little bit more selling. Yeah. Well, who's going to be watching this is everyone, Russ. Okay. Right. This is the greatest right. building owner webinar of all time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let me flip it back to me. I'm going to take that. Thank you, Zach, for the, the demo. Um, let me share my screen here. All right. Um, so lastly, so we did the demo and now I want to just talk a little bit more about the future. So this is interesting. Okay. So we just saw, we're talking about these mixed use campuses, really not just one building, but multiple buildings or, you know, like a college campus, for example. Um, and talking about, I think Russ earlier, you said something that I think resonates with everyone right now is the cost of the delivery isn't really getting cheaper. Like there's always that cost there. And that's why like a company like Ritual doing office pickup is efficient because it's just pickup. Um, but we got, all, you know, it's not a good futuristic tech webinar without talking about robots. You know, it's like kind of obligatory at this point. So we got to talk a little bit about delivery robots. And if these are potential to solve in certain campuses, um, this problem. So I'll, I'll start on my thoughts, but you know, if the campus is flat and the, it's actually traversable via something with wheels, like I think it'll work. And in a New York City, like a rocket, like when New York City is back to its peak, you know, when the vaccine hits and a year from now it's, it's crowded again, these robots may have a hard time traversing the Hudson Yards area. But in a certain environment, in a more rural campus setting, I think this is actually one way that uh, could be solved. So I think Starship in the top right here is one of the early pioneers of this. And they may have started a little too early, but it's getting a little more traction on um, like rural college campuses. And I think it's because like there, those are set up where it's, it's not, there's enough room for these robots to travel. Have you seen any of this stuff, Russ? Have you talked about any of these with owners or Scott? Yeah, I haven't. You know, I deal mostly in the New York City market. So I have seen a robot in a hotel in Midtown that takes things from the front desk to the hotel rooms. I forget what it's called, but you would have loved it, Steve. It was like four feet tall. And, you know, like if you if you call downstairs and you ask for, you know, toothpaste, they open up the little bin, they put the toothpaste in it. I think it's a woman voice. The woman says like, I'll see you later. <laughs> she walks into the elevator or she rolls into the elevator, takes it to the room and comes back. So I think I haven't seen so much like in sprawling campuses, how this could work. Although I think, I think it probably could if it's flat, but within buildings, I think for sure, since you have more of a, um, since you have a more kind of protected environment, you totally could have these things traversing hallways. For sure. Yeah. I think that, um, it's in a New York City. I mean, obviously, we're a New York City company. You and I hang out in New York City a lot. Mm -hmm. I don't really see them, you know, going down Second Avenue. No. Uh, no. I just, you know, New Yorkers, they'll kick them over. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. And I'm a robot enthusiast and I would try to hug the robot, but I, I can see that it'd be difficult to, I think it would be difficult for them to actually do the logistics. But I definitely see them in, um, you know, like Phoenix or something a little more sprawled. Where there's a little more room. So th these will pop up in certain markets. The other ones are, I don't know if you've seen this other company called Neuro, but this is a very interesting one where it's, and this is a little bit outside of what we're talking about today, but because we're talking about owners and in, in their on-campus um, delivery, but Neuro is like the one in the top left where they can drive on the highway essentially and try to lower the DoorDash cost. Mm. Um, which it, I think it's like prototyping right now in Houston, Texas. So Houston's gonna, they've got permits in that city. So I am inter interested to see if like, you know, the $6 it costs to deliver a burger across town. If one of these companies can solve that, I think that could be a pretty big game changer for delivery because, you know, the fundamental flaw of delivery is the delivery cost that no one really wants to pay except for venture capitalists, which, they seem to be stoked to pay that cost. Um, we'll see how long it lasts though. I think that um, that is the opportunity though that people are betting on it getting cheaper there. Yep. yep. Um, which is, uh, I don't know how it'll play out. I, I do think that the tech is closer now so that this this type of vehicle theoretically should work. So it's pretty exciting to 
to see about. Have you heard of cul-de-sac, Steve? What's that? Cul-de-sac is going to be the the country's first carless neighborhood. Um, it's opening in Tempe, Arizona, and that's somewhere that I could see, you know, playing around with something like this, where they don't have to deal with random cars on the road. It's just a bunch of flat green spaces. Um, yeah, super cool. Should be opening, I think, sometime next year. Ah, uh, here we go. Yeah, this is pretty interesting. So, um, I did they talk about this in New York now after the? Uh, oh, wow, there's so many pop-ups. <laughs> the fast company hits you with all the ads, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think cul-de-sac is going to go to other markets before New York, but it's a pretty cool value proposition. And if you could come up with a delivery ecosystem here that didn't rely on drivers, you know, maybe you could mess around with the with the with the robot concept. But I think it's I think it's a great concept. Didn't New York talk about getting rid of or one of the the mayor talk about like getting rid of cars in Manhattan? <laughs> Yeah, they started charging more if you're in a certain zone during a certain time. But I mean, I think we just got to hold our breath on New York for the next year or two. No one knows anything, I don't think. All right. Lastly, I know uh, we got ten minutes. Let's go to the let's go to the uh, Q and A here. Um, although we have other, we have our own Q and A, but let's uh, see what we've got here. All right. So we've got um, anonymous attendee right now it's very difficult to get people back into the office and in order to comply with code restrictions the office tenants can't leave the building and buildings ban delivery drivers companies want to subsidize lunch for their employees to get them to come back but they have to close their cafeterias and common areas so how can companies subsidize lunches with more of an outpost model russ how can companies subsidize lunches with more of an outpost model yeah, basically um, the challenge here is that they're actually right. we saw this with the NYU hospital. The challenge is that the cap, the common areas aren't are restricted too. So what what what's the what are we to do as owners? Well, there's this question is hitting on a couple of things. It's talking about subsidizing lunches, which you're talking about some kind of a loyalty program or some kind of a corporate ordering program, right? Um, the outpost model, you know, I think there's probably ways you can work with um, insured delivery couriers that have all of the necessary requirements so they can actually walk throughout the building. The lowest hanging fruit is to work directly with building management so that if you can get the food to the front desk, you know, it's got to be on the landlord to get it to the individual office. Otherwise, I agree with your with your your challenge here. You, you're just not going to be able to get it upstairs if people can't walk around. Yeah. All right. We got plenty of questions here. So we'll keep going through. What do you see as um opportunities for apartments. Do you see WeWork doing anything in this space for us? Um, I know WeWork's definitely thinking about it because they're obviously, their whole value prop is you should join WeWork instead of go to your own office because we provide better amenities. So I think there's huge opportunity for companies like WeWork um, and big apartment buildings as well. There's tons of opportunity. The landlords just have to have to recognize it and want to invest time and a little bit of money to figure it out. Yeah. Definitely. Oh, um, the other thing I wanted to say on that, these building ordering systems are only going to be as successful as the marketing that's behind them. So if a landlord with a thousand apartments does this, but doesn't put a sign anywhere saying that it's available and doesn't implement it into their email, kind of like communication with tenants, this will never work. So it's not just about the monetary investment from the landlord. It's more so about, you know, the, the communication investment and actually wanting people to know that this is part of your offerings. Yeah. The reason people order Seamless is because Seamless emails you five times a day to order. Exactly. Uh, and it knows exactly what you ordered and it'll give you discounts on things you ordered previously. It's, you know, it's an uphill oh, it's, battle fighting those guys. It's raining outside. You should order. <laughs> That's what they do. <laughs> yeah. Um, what about, okay, so I'll take this question. The question is group orders are more, are they more profitable for upselling than individual orders? The answer, I like to take it from the restaurant's point of view here. Restaurants love large group orders because they can be more efficient. You know, you might, if you do $1,000 of sales, individual orders and $1,000 from a group order, it's a lot easier on the restaurant to do the one group order because again, it's just, a, it's for their staffing model and doing it all at once. They can be a little bit more efficient with their people and it's really convenient for them. So restaurants are always on board to 
try any type of salt for it. Like if you're an owner thinking about, oh, are the restaurants going to like this? You know, one of the value props you can talk to your restaurants is to say, hey, we're going to drive catering orders and more group ordering um, with this system too. And that restaurants love that because that, that makes it easier on them to run their business. Hey, Steve, if you look at the next comment down that talks about um, how community aspect of commercial real estate and food halls can be leveraged to facilitate group ordering, I yeah. think it's a great point and it's one that that landlords should absolutely be thinking about. It's a thankless job maybe, but curating experiences throughout your building and saying like, look, you and all your friends can hang out out here and order whatever you want from anywhere. That to me is a cool community focused um, use case, but a landlord's got to want to do that, you know? And a lot of times, like Steve said, they've got enough going on running their building. It's going to have to fall on one of the, um, you know, tenant experience associates to make this happen. But it's a cool use case and one that I hope more landlords uh, develop. Yeah, for sure. Our friend, uh, oh, Bradley's listening in. Our friend Bradley had a question here. Is there an option for brands to be in a grid view with logos instead of a scroll bar? Uh, more visibility for the brands. Absolutely, Bradley. So um, I can show you how we're going to set that up. We've uh, implemented a unique way to start the first landing page with like more of a tile setup um, so that like, people can see the different brands. And why don't you reach out for a, a customized demo on that? <laughs> we'll show you. Um, all right. Well, I think this is, we got five minutes left. Russ, this was my favorite thing I've done all week. So I'm glad you've, you've come and joined Zach and me on this endeavor. Um, anything no else on top of your mind? A lot of stuff going on in the news. The space is heating up in virtual kitchens. I know we were talking before the webinar started. What are your thoughts on the order mark fundraise? 120 million. I am just nervous that food quality will go down. And we're going to end up being reduced to the lowest common denominator. You know, if all this money is being poured into virtual restaurants and we end up just getting the next generation of McDonald's, Wendy's, Taco Bell, Popeye's, et cetera, you know, maybe some people will make a lot of money and will have changed the way people order food. But for a guy that likes to go out and eat and enjoy good food, um, you know, and talking to my restaurant friends, I just hope that we can maintain the integrity and the hospitality of, of the food and beverage industry. Do you think um, the restaurants, like the brands that we all love to go out to eat at, are they feeling pressured to create their own virtual brand? And if so, why? Because like, I don't know, I still like to order from the restaurant I go out to eat to. Like I order delivery from the diner down in Queens. I think restaurants are, are doing anything they can to survive. So if they think that popping up a virtual brand can add a little bit of extra income, they're going to try it. You know, our good friends, Michael Babin and Robin over at Neighborhood Restaurant Group, they launched Neighborhood Provisions, which is basically a grocery um, outpost during COVID. So I think restaurants are feeling pressured every single day because COVID has decimated the entire industry. So I hope that the restaurants that we know and love can, can figure it out and stay in business. I got to be honest, I'm not all that excited about random virtual restaurants popping up. It seems like a a land grab and a quick way for some people to make a lot of money, but I don't think it's good for, for society as a whole. You got to try the hot box by Wiz Khalifa. I will try the hot box by Wiz Khalifa only because I, uh, I'm, I'm curious, but I don't even know if you can get it in New York city. I don't know if you can, I think they said it was, but I'm not sure if they actually got their launch yet, but I, I wonder, I think they're doing like, if it's going to work, it's going to be well marketed. Like it's gotta be. Cause again, Part of the reason a lot of New Yorkers that I know, my friends, order delivery, it's because they've actually been to that restaurant. Right. And they, they like to, or that's the built in neighborhood marketing. These virtual brands, I'm not quite sure, you know, how consumers are going to receive them. If you've never been there, you're less likely, the data shows if you haven't been there before, you're less likely to order. Yeah. I'm just worried that with food trending more towards e commerce and less towards like traditional brick and mortar hospitality right? Like the, you, people are going to be eating what they're fed on their phones, you know, because people are going to be dumping so much money into marketing and retargeting that the same way that we all get pop-up ads about Warby Parker and Lululemon, you know, you're not always going to be eating at the places that you used to like eating. You're going to be eating at the places that popped up while you were watching 
Grey's Anatomy, Steve, and you're gonna, you know, you're gonna be ordering pints of ice cream because it knew you were watching Grey's Anatomy. That's Whoa. what I'm. That's what I'm afraid of. We got it. It's collaborative. Yeah. Well, then we'll do like group watching. You know, you'll watch it from your house. I'll watch it from my house together, and it'll market to both of us to share in the same meal. But we'll never hang out anymore. <laughs> I think it's almost 11 o'clock, Steve. We, yeah. we, people don't need to know about our Grey's Anatomy watch party. <laughs> All right. Top of the hour. We did it. We'll send out the recording to everyone as well. We appreciate everyone's time today. And until next time, we're signing off. Thanks, guys.